Hello. Today I'm going to read Dunkelheit, which in my opinion is my best story that I have written. Short story, of course. This story is based on a short dream I had, though I added a great deal more. Finished in January of 2016. <clears throat> I do not know who, if anyone, will read this. I will be dead most likely before I even finish writing. I will do in death what I did in life. I will write until my last breath. If someone finds these last words of mine, knowing my luck, they will be a grammar Nazi. Even as I write now, the lights begin to fade. I am writing with what little battery life my phone has. As soon as that happens, I will die shortly thereafter. I can even hear them now, pounding on the door, still screaming that inhuman sound. At first, they were so silent. Nobody heard them. Nobody believed it, either. An unholy darkness fell that night. It was subtle at first. The inability for the sun to rise was at first dismissed as a natural phenomenon. I imagined some sp speculated. I imagined some speculated that some kind of solar eclipse combined with thick clouds or some such thing. I have no idea what people actually said. I woke up late for work. It was 10:30 a.m. I told Jill to wake me up. I was her relief, so I assumed her phone must have died. My room was pitch black. I have the windows thoroughly covered, so it is supposed to be dark in my room. I grab my phone and look to see it, it, it at 83% and not charging. I follow the charging cord with my left hand and hold up the phone with my right to use as a light source. I see and feel it is fully plugged in. I thought for a moment that and was still waking up, so I cannot quite recall if the electric bill was paid on time or not. I believe I said some sort of generic, pessimistic reaction. Of course. I looked back at my phone screen to learn that I did not have a signal or was out of service. I know I paid it yesterday and even received the confirmation text. A blackout would explain everything. I desperately get up from bed. I look at my clothes on the dresser I casually put there last night. I looked back at my phone, 80% at that moment. Damn it, it's a blackout. I'd better conserve the phone. I shouldn't be on Facebook longer than a quick post or two when I get a chance. I used the phone to guide my steps to the clothes on the dresser. I dressed and then walked out of my room. I opened the door and fail to notice that it's just as dark outside. It did not dawn on me that the hallway should be lit up from the windows. I even walked past two windows on my way to the kitchen before I realized just how dark it was. I stop in the middle of the hallway, fully aware. I walk back, looking out the window. The curtain was even open, total blackness. I open the window, thinking this could possibly be some sort of prank, and my window is merely covered in some such thing. I gazed upon the total darkness. There were no stars, no street lights, nothing. I look back at my phone, pondering if perhaps the time is simply wrong, that it had to be a blackout? cloudy night. Mayhaps the blackout caused the cell tower to stop sending signals. The most logical possibility was my phone time charged somehow. Perhaps due to being out of service, it reset to factory time, which would be Taiwan, so it might be 10.40 a.m. there? I continued to rationalize to myself. Oh, how naive I was with my skepticism. For years I mocked the superstitious and doomsday preppers, believing them idiots, though no amount of doomsday preparations could have prepared me, let alone anyone, for what was to come. With the window still open, I hear a distant gunshot. It sounded like a gunshot. Fears of home invasions crept their way into my mind, sleeping deep into my thoughts. If I had a phone or the internet or some way to contact someone, I could perhaps make sense of this. I clung to my skepticism and used it as a shield to prevent ludicrous thoughts of unseen things lurking. My skepticism cannot protect me from the thoughts of home invasion. That, after all, could happen. I finished getting dressed and grabbed my keys along with proper flashlight and a baseball bat. <laughs> I step outside with my phone in my pocket. The door was now locked, bat in one hand, light in the other. My phone was at 75%. I leave it on in case a signal picks up so I could immediately be notified by a buzz and vibrate in my front right pocket of my cargo pants. I walk to my car and try to stay focused on 
and not think about the absolute blackness all around and in the sky. I am fully awake and feel fully rested as well. It simply does not feel like night to me, yet my eyes are not lying. I look with my light leading the way and get to my car. It quiet too. I do not know which is more frightening, the darkness or the silence. But they go hand in hand and complement one another. They more than double the creeping fear, for reasons I could not then rationalize and even now struggle to understand. I had that being watched and followed feeling the moment I started walking. The closer I was to my car, the closer it felt behind me. I dared not turn around out of this irrational fear, I admit, was out of character for me, but that darkness and silence was overwhelming to me. My car, thankfully, was unlocked. I opened the door and jumped in, slamming it behind myself as, I, as quickly as I could muster. I could feel something following me, and I swear I heard something touch the door. It was a light brush. The sound was hard to identify, but it sounded almost like a hand slightly caressing the door just inches from me. I convinced myself that this had to be in my mind, for I could see nothing on the other side of the window on my left. I started the car with no problem. The headlights turned on with no difficulty either, yet the lights either struggled to fully illuminate or my eyes revealed actual tangible darkness dispersing upon the light touching it. The light seemed to cut through the darkness, and it appeared like some sort of black mist that reeled away at the touch of light. Still clinging to my rationality, I frown at my unrealistic fears and sights and back the car out of the driveway. Nor the drivers were in sight. I saw plenty of cars parked on the side of the road in front of the unlit houses. No pedestrians, no mobile life in sight. The trees are unmoving due to no wind. No wind isn't highly unusual, but it did add a third creepy addition to this. I drive slowly and eventually make my way out of the suburb and to the main street. My plan was to go to Walmart. They're open 24-7. Today isn't a holiday. They'll be open. Surely it'll be fine just after I get there and see another living face. I imagine a worst case scenario and everyone is dead, and this is some sort of alien or demonic thing that is attacking. I shove that to the back of my mind, refusing to entertain such an idea. <clears throat> I finally reached the Walmart store, and throughout the entire drive down Main Street, I saw no living person. I kept just missing figures in the distance. They felt like a mirage because they could be seen just momentarily as the light shines from my headlights. I dis dismissed them all as just wild imaginations, regardless of the high number I continued to witness. The only light that showed was from my car. Only upon arrival to the store did it occur to me to check the radio. However, the store was a terror all of its own. Out of habit, I took out... I, I, out of habit, I look at my phone. 70%. No signal. 11 a.m. Walmart was dark. I sat in my car within the empty parking lot. The only other vehicle in sight was a crashed car lying on the driver's side, perfectly still in a foreboding fashion. I, rec I can recall my time aboard a naval cruiser. We docked in Seoul, South Korea. I remember walking in some back alleys alone late at night, making my way back to the ship. That experience was somewhat frightening. This was much worse. I even have a car now along with a cell phone, and in the back of my car is a shotgun. The gun! I unfastened my seatbelt, jumping to the back seat, maneuvering my way to the trunk from inside the car. I stopped with a brief moment to ponder. I recall thinking to myself, am I really going to go inside a Walmart with a loaded weapon? I need to keep calm and be certain this is a good idea. I looked outside at my car, at the toppled vehicle outside, just to be sure that something is terribly wrong. There was no room for doubt. My gun was needed. Anything could have caused this, and if I continue to maintain a level head, I do believe being robbed or attacked by another person is quite possible. Besides, I told myself, I'm looking for people. I'm not here to take anything, as if I needed to convince myself that I am not a looter, but a man looking for other people. I was quite... Justified in being armed, I took my shotgun and climbed back to the driver's seat. I parked closer to the entrance, which is actually open. The store on the inside appeared every bit as dark as everywhere else. I turn the car off but leave the lights on out of habit. I look at my phone again, 65%. I repocketed it and stepped out of the car. My keys were now in my other hand pocket. 
Shotgun and right arm, flashlight and left, and into the darkened store I trekked. If I had even the slightest clue as to what I, I would find, I would never have gone inside. Walmart. <sighs> the store was every bit as dark as everywhere else. However, the exit sign was still lit. A bad omen? I comforted. I was comforted, not worried when I saw it, because it meant that somewhere in this store is an emergency power source beating that exit sign. I wondered why the store lights were not lit from the same source. I didn't wander long, though. I entered the store, noticing that the entrance doors were not open as I thought, but broken and folded on both sides, bent against the perspective walls. Either something powerful, like a hurricane, blew them open, or rioters pushed their way into the store. My imagination brought to mind an image of a large, hulking beast. I shook that idea away. Just as I crossed the entrance to this store, I heard a very loud breaking sound. I looked behind me to where it was coming from. The lights on my car go out immediately. I turn on the flashlight and shine it at the direction of both my car and that sound. My headlights were busted. The glass lay on the ground, signifying it. My car is crushed in from the top, rendering it undrivable. I step back in alarm. I held the gun up and shout, Whoever is there, I am armed, and if you do not show yourself, I will fire. I felt as though I talked only to myself. I walked back to my car and shine my light all about. The shadows disappear slowly versus instantly, just as before, like, like when driving earlier. I felt something touch my sleeve. I jerk and shine my light at this attacker. All I see is a person-shaped shadow fade as my light beam touches it. Without hesitation, instinct, I suppose, I fire my gun. I fear gripping hard as my firing hits nothing. I can feel something brush against my sleeve a second time. And with flight response in full gear, I dash into the store, sprinting without forethought. I had no idea what this was, but all reason now left me. As I panicked my way through the da that dark store, I swear I felt that same kind of tug touch my flashlight. The light started to fade, and within seconds, the flashlight was dead. I continued to run through the pitch black store like some kind of foolish, thoughtless child. Without sight, I was hopelessly lost. I stopped running. Fortunately for me, I ran into nothing. I, I must have been in the middle of a grocery aisle because of, it was very cold. I noticed but gave no recognition to the light hum of the refrigerators and freezers for the f frozen food was running. I shake my flashlight thoroughly with hopes that perhaps a battery simply came loose. I take the batteries out and put them back in. It was no use. I toss the flashlight. I reach into my pocket and pull out my phone. It is the only possible light source I have. 62%. I activate flashlight mode. This will burn my battery faster, but right at that moment, this darkness, darkness was far worse than a dead cell phone. I quickly take in my surroundings. The shadows were normal here. None of that, whatever it was, appeared near me, at least for that moment anyways. I recall feeling very grateful that, for that refrigerator hum. It was the only sound, otherwise that silence would be maddening. I looked around myself, using my phone's flashlight. Many fridge doors are open. Several hung on one hinge. A few fridge doors are completely ripped off and laying on the floor as if carelessly tossed there. I do not know what compelled me to look up, but the moment I shined my light above me, the shadows scattered. These shadows have formed actual shapes, and I could actually see them skittering on the ceiling like some kind of insect or spider. Christ, they move so fast. I saw more shadows dart around between several aisles down from my location. I placed my phone and my front pocket with the flashlight portion peeked out at the top that where I faced the light would face as well. I spin around to get a quick look all around me, only to see more of those dark figures from the ceiling skittering away whenever my light shined it. It looked up again to see one descending down to me. I immediately ran. While running, I could feel the shadows and darkness creep just behind me. I could feel it almost grabbing me. I did not want to know what it looked like. I only wanted out of that death trap building. For some reason, my anxiety bolstered, bolstered when my thoughts turned to my phone battery life. It's going to be at almost 50-something percent, I thought. 
I continued running, trying to reach out, wall within this, reach any wall within this door so I could be in less of an open area. The bathroom, stock room, office, anything. My pace slowed down, not because of the, some f fatigue, but from something clenching, <sighs> clenching me as I ran, something not quite solid. It was the darkness actually touching me. Up until this moment, I could not confirm it. Yet, here it was, tugging at me, trying to slow me down, trying to pull me back. I believe my phone light was the only thing preventing it from fully grabbing me. I struggled to increase my pace. I must have been sprinting, yet knew I could not be exceeding eight miles per hour at the most. It was like trying to run in some sort of light water. I could move faster than I could in water, yet the air still felt thick. If my light were brighter, I knew it would have helped somehow. I could see luminous a luminous exit sign. This could only mean that I was approaching the wall. How lucky I briefly felt to not only run without tripping on the plethora of debris that littered the ground, but also miraculously run the correct direction to a back room, a more closed off area, and an exit. Escape from this micro hell. I, I without thought, pushed one of those dull doors that was labeled employees only. I slammed the door behind me to try anyways. The damn slow closing mechanism made it close with difficulty. I felt that if I let it go, the darkness would keep it open. The door did close. Two seconds of tugging. Those two seconds felt like an eternity. I take no time to rest. I shine my light about, discover no skittering shadows. I quickly look at my phone. Still, no phone signal and 48% battery life, 12.02 p.m. I turn off flashlight mode. I check out my gun in the semi-darkness to ensure it is okay. Five in the shotgun itself and ten in my pocket. With my phone in my front pocket once again, not nearly as bright due to shining regular screen light, I take another look around. I remember this being the moment my remaining skepticism and rationality were thrown out the window. I knew I could convince myself that those skittering things were bats or squirrels. I knew I could convince myself that a bear attacked my car. I even knew that I could dismiss the thick darkness as nothing more than in my head. I can even convince myself that all of this is just some wild dream or crazy high. I could, but if I did, I would have to ignore my fast-beating heart. I could not deny my heart is racing, and never in any dream have I ever felt my heart beat. I did not care about the how or the why. I accepted it all without argument or disbelief. I refused to stay in that spot, huddled in, in the corner, especially with that door next to me. I move on through what can only be the back storeroom. It always resembles a mini warehouse. I start to walk slowly, clenching my gun. This, this storage room wasn't torn asunder like the main floor of this Walmart. The shelves were undisturbed. Everything was intact in this place. I didn't know if I should have been scared by it or felt safe by it. The darkness either hasn't come back here yet, or it is waiting and hiding for me to turn the wrong corner. I treaded slowly. Even though I'm wearing boots, I kept my steps quiet, clutching my guns with my fingers, finger close to the trigger. I walked past the office. I saw a moving shadow. I fire in that direction immediately. As I pump the gun, preparing to fire again, I hear a voice. Wait, they said. A person. Or was the darkness trying to fool me? I have no idea, even while writing this, what exactly the darkness is, let alone its full power. <clears throat> let me see you, I shouted. A figure slowly stood up. I looked closer to see an actual face. I stepped forward, not removing my hands from the firearm in the least. I moved closer to allow my phone light to shine on their face. It was confirmed. This was a real person. I recognized them as an employee here. I've actually, t I've never actually talked to them, but could see their name tag. Brian. Brian? I asked, indicating I see their name tag. Yes, please. They asked, hinting at my gun. I'd lowered my weapon. Yes, sorry, not sorry. It's okay. I'm just glad I'm not alone, Brian said. I woke up not long ago. What's going on? Is it really only... I looked up my phone to see 12.15 a.m. 12.15 a.m.? Just tell me I'm not crazy, he said. It would mean that I am too, I said.
Brian backed up against the wall, slumping down with his hands on his face. I don't know what to do. Me neither. We just have time to talk. We might have time to talk later. I'm not convinced that this place is safe. If this darkness is alive and thinking, it might simply not have known about this back room. But me running back here. So it followed you? You've killed me, Brian cried. I felt sorry for Brian. I blame myself for what happened next. There is a distinct yet subtle difference between regular shadow darkness and this hideous abomination. The tangible darkness is hard to notice, but if looked directly at, it is easy to notice. It was not looking directly at the darkened corner of the room just behind Brian. His shadow slowly grew, grew larger as we talked. Brian's shadow began to malform before my very eyes, and I had not noticed until it was too late. <clears throat> Something from behind Brian stabbed into him, without piercing all the way through. I could not see exactly what stabbed him, and within the blink of an eye, it tugged him into his own shadow, where he vanished entirely. The shadow, the shadow remained, even with my subtle phone light touching him. Jesus Christ! I exclaimed. I even st stepped back instinctively. I raised my gun and pointed it directly at Brian's shadow. I aimed very fast, and even with a shaky hand, I fired directly into Brian's shadow. The shotgun pellets themselves did nothing. The shadow appeared to turn around towards me. I swear as God as my witness, I saw eyes made of the darkness itself. The eyes opened up. They were a dark red, not like blood, but of the same color the moon is in that rare sanguine form. Those eyes looked at me or through me could not tell. Then the shadow move, thing moved my direction. I bolted away and out of that office. The idea of a closed-in area like this now frightened me more than an open area like the store. <clears throat> I hurried out of that office, slamming the door shut. I glanced at the door. I entered to this back storage room moments earlier to see the darkness bleeding through the crack under the, the door and various other places all about the walls. I run further into the storage room, hoping that the exit sign is true and not misplaced. I saw the double doors just thirty paces ahead. The exit sign loomed just above it, indicating an actual exit. As I run, I see the tangible darkness lurking and squirming all around. The room is flooding with it. The shadows are moving my direction. Just to the side of the door is a shadow with eyes. I believe this is a different one than Brian. I charge forward, knowing this is the only way. I moved slow like water, yet I knew it could move faster. Or can it? I just ran past it and burst through the door furthest from that walking nightmare. I could feel it try to grab me. I escaped the Walmart. I did not stop running right away. I discovered that I am behind the store. I quickly look at my phone. No signal. 42% battery life. 12.20 p.m. I placed my phone back in my shirt. I didn't. I even did that while running. I looked around while continuing to move. My breathing was already heavy. I moved my pace, but not much. I, I slowed my pace, but not much. All around me was darkness. I looked back to no longer even be able to see the Walmart. This maddening darkness will have me the moment my battery is dead. I knew at that moment that I needed to, a place to hide, and if I could not find one, I would need a way to move faster. My car was clearly destroyed. I continued moving forward, which I have no way to decipher my direction. The best I can tell is I'm in the rear parking lot. Without warning, mainly due to my speed, my body slammed into a parked car. It was more surprising than painful. I stumbled to the ground because of the impact. I stumbled to my feet, almost falling again due to my refusal to let go of my gun. After I regained my footing, I ran again but tripped over something, falling yet again. I looked to see it was a body. I crawled back in fear, but quickly realized that it was a dead body and nothing more. I let out a slight sigh of relief and got back up. I took two, pa two steps from this car to continue running. Then it occurred to me. I bent down to search the, the pockets of this dead body. After only a few seconds, I find what I was searching for. I found their keys. I smiled an almost hysterical smile, then tried to unlock the car. I felt that same feeling from earlier when I first left my home tonight. I feel the darkness approaching me. I care not if this 
was mere paranoia or somehow my soul can sense it and was warning me. All I know is I needed to leave. The first key I tried actually worked. No idea who I thanked, but I out loud said, thank you. I get in the car, slamming the door behind me, refusing to die like this. I grabbed my phone and quickly looked through, throughout this car as best I can, as I could with two seconds. I saw no red eyes and no moving shadows. I turned back to the steering wheel, started the car, and turned on the headlights. Immediately, the sudden brightness caused the darkness to scatter. It's all alive, I yell, said to myself. I shift to first gear and drive. The road ahead of me was clear of crashed cars and other such debris. I drove on the main road and made my way to the highway just half a mile down the road. I quickly looked at my phone and see 38% battery life, no signal, 12.30 p.m. No surprise. I do not know if my eyes could have, could somehow adjusted, had somehow adjusted or if the darkness was dispersing, but I could somehow see the road and surrounding area as if moonlight touched it, no moon shone. As I looked in the distance of the highway, I could see shadows that were just, just like how Brian was after he was engulfed. They moved slow, or at least slower than I. I could look in the distance and see them everywhere. The distance ones ignored me, shuffling around randomly like zombies. The ones that the vehicle came maybe twenty feet from would cease shuffling about and follow me. I attracted them. I could somehow tell that they would never stop following me. I glanced at the fuel gauge. It read maybe one-tenth. It was about thirty minutes from being in the red. After that, there would be no telling how long I would have until walking would be the only option. I continued to drive frantically, looking for any place I could run to. I had no idea if hiding was even an option. That night, sight didn't last long either. Whether the darkness intentionally sh allowed me to see or I chanced upon a weak moment, I still have no idea. My headlights no doubt were attracting more of those darkened figures. What were my options? Even now, while writing this, I fail to think of any possible alternative for how I could have found my way. 30, 33% battery life after driving for that half hour. The gas was in the red. The warning light came on. My inevitable doom came closer as fuel continued to burn away. Praying was never a strong suit for me. Nonetheless, I admit that I did that in that frightening moment. Either some god took pity on me, or the darkness likes to play with its food. The next moment felt like a miracle. I saw a lit-up cross. I saw a semblance of salvation, and not that bogus one they always boasted about, but literal salvation from the darkness. The car ran out of fuel and came to a stop. I was less than 100 yards from the door to that church. I haven't run 100 yards since high school football. 30% battery life. 1.15 p.m. I pocket my phone. I take in a deep breath with a single movement. I simultaneously grab my gun and open my door while pushing my way out. I can feel my body push through that tangible darkness. I refuse to let the fear grip me. I made my thoughts escape to football practice from years ago. Run! I imagine the coach's voice. I gave no thoughts to the car. I paid no mind to the surrounding darkness. I refuse to even consider the countless shadows shadow things chasing me just behind me i only listen to the voice i imagine i force the coach's voice to be the only thing in my mind you run to the other end of the field you weak slow waste of my time so i ran those supposed 100 yards i ran until i reached the door i could hear behind me the car smashed by god knows what manifestation the darkness conjured the church is average in size the front door has the overhead entrance light shining on it. I grab the doorknob, ready to break the door down if I need to. Instead, however, the door opens for me, and I fall in. Something prevented me from falling by grabbing my left left and right arms. The door slammed behind me as I, as I am pulled in. I was too disoriented and tired, trying to catch my breath to notice them take my gun with me. I, I tried to take in the, my surroundings. It was a man on my right and another on my left holding me. A third was behind me, locking the doors, deadbolt, and wedging the makeshaft barricade back into place. A fourth man stood in front of me, holding my gun. 
He also held an expression and looked me right in the eyes, letting me know that he isn't going to let my weapon go. Honestly, I felt so grateful to these men that I cared not about my gun. The man on my left shouted behind me to the man looking at the door, Did any follow him? The man shouted back, No, I don't think so. The man, the left man looked right at the gunman. Is he free of darkness? The gunman aims the gun at me and carefully looks around my face. Talk! I was still breathing heavily but managed to say, Thank you. The gunman lowers my gun and nods to the other three. You're stuck in here. If you need to leave, you aren't coming back in. Do you understand? He asked me. Yes. They let me go. I look at my surroundings. The windows are all boarded and blinds, curtains shut. The door behind me is firmly shut. There is a door in front of me that appears to lead to the main chapel room. That door was open, revealing the pews and plethora of crosses. It looked exactly like I would expect a Catholic chapel room. We walked inside. The room was well lit. I even had candles ready to light, too. Lots of lamps are plugged in. I was still catching my breath, just like those four. I thought maybe there would be, would be, or could be others, but there wasn't. They didn't say anything to me. There was a long silence. I didn't know what to say. Neither did they. They seemed to have no desire to talk. I looked at my phone. Twenty-six percent. This caught all of their attention. Two of them looked very confused. One had no, no outward expression, and the last man laughed at me. I looked directly at him as I put my phone back in my pocket. What's so funny? I asked him. You got a signal? He said very sarcastically. No, but why is that so funny? I pressed the question. The world is dead, probably entirely engulfed in this madness. You don't know that. How could you? I asked. Even if this darkness is isolated to here, which I doubt, we're, we're still going to die. I'm not dying tonight. Another of, you four, another of the four interjected. Hey, phone man, what time is it? The cynical man asked me. I take my phone back out. I look at it. It says 1.35 p.m. But I can't be right. But this can't be right. Nothing is right, another said. What is all this? What is going on? I asked all four of them. We've already talked about this for hours before you got here. The fourth man finally spoke. I think it's a dream that I cannot wake up from like I'm in some kind of coma. Seth, the man on your right, believes it's the devil and judgment day. The other guy who held you when you came in, he came in, thinks this is some sort of government experiment. And the man holding the gun, well, he could tell you himself what he thinks. I look at, I look right at him. Yes, my gun. You can give that back now, I said to him. No, at least not yet, he said and then paused for my response. I said nothing. These four were all I know, the last other humans. I cannot fight them. I must hold my quarrels. I stared at him silently. He continued satisfied he can hold my weapon for the time being. I have studied abroad. I read a lot of books. For some reason, the occult fascinated me more than philosophy, religion, science, and everything else. I have studied dozens of forms of witchcraft. Green, chaos, death, satanic. He paused after that last word. Nobody interjected. Alchemy, blood magic, and so much more. However, once I came across a book like no other. What kind of book? And why would it matter? I impatiently interpreted. I'm getting to that. It looked old. I found it in some antiques shop downtown of our little town here. I had no idea who the previous owner was, but the author was named Alexander de Mao. He wrote nothing of himself. The book was called Dunkelheit. The book was in German. It took me some time to translate it. I learned that it was a translation from a Latin version. The Latin version was a translation from an even deader language that nobody even remembers the name of. Yeah? I'm sorry for interrupting again, but what exactly are you getting at? I asked. Dunkelheit is German for darkness. That, that book contained so much information, things I'd never imagined. It talked about blood rituals and sacrifices to open up vistas of reality you couldn't possibly imagine. He seemed almost to laugh as he spoke now. This made me uneasy as I wished he did not have that gun. At first, I, I learned simply 
little mimicry. After a few months, I learned how to control incorporeal shadows. It was very entertaining. Trust me when I say that I never intended this. What do you mean you've never intended this? One of the other men asked. Not intentionally. The book talked about opening the world to unseen things. If I knew this would be would have been the result, I swear I would have burned that damn book. The other two the other three men had doubtful expressions. The third, though, held his chin in contemplation. In his eyes I could see his opinion actually shifting to blaming the gunman. Then maybe if we give the darkness you, it will go away, he suggested. Earlier you didn't tell us that you were the one to do whatever magic this was. You simply told us that you read that book, and a, and a friend of yours did this, another said to the gunman, pointing an accusing finger. That was before. I had a gun to protect myself from the three if you knew I am to blame. You bastard! The third exclaimed, meaning that all three others believed that this gunman, this madman, is to blame for everything. I held my anger down. My curiosity and desperation to survive outweighed my rage I felt for this man. So if what you say is true, that you caused this, how far does it go and how do we stop it? It either goes a few miles or goes everywhere. So either everyone will be dead in a few hours, if not dead already, or just us five will die in a few hours. Once the darkness has someone, they can never revert. As soon as power is out and the last candle is burnt out, we die. Maybe if I had the book, I could do something, but I lost it just as the ritual that spawned this finished. It could literally be anywhere. I've looked since this began hours ago. I cannot find it. So that's it? We die? Just like that? One of the others asked, confirming their belief in the story. The three men looked at each other with anger in their eyes. They looked back at the gunman, whose name I never found out. While I wanted to kill him every bit as badly as they did, I'm not stupid. He's armed and we are not. They lunge at the gunman all at once. The gunman does not hesitate in shooting the closest attacker. He dies right away. The remainder of the momentum caused him to fly into the wall. The gunman hits the second uh, with the butt of the gun to get him to back away. The third attacker managed to grab the gunman from behind. I took this opportunity to join the fight. I grab my gun and we all pull it from each other, both attempting to gain it from the other. This caused the gun to fire. It fires right into a window. The boards loosen and fall off. The glass shatters and fear grips us from the bottom of our souls. The four of us free, staring out that dark window. It moved so fast it slithered across the ceiling, making its way to all the lights in the room. The gunman came to his senses first. He knocked his, his head, butting the man, holding him from behind. This freed him. He kicked me, causing me to fall back. Just as this happened, the darkness attacked and destroyed all of the light sources in the room. The room went dark. Although some light is seeping into this room from the hallway, it was enough light for me to see the gunman and the man behind him become wrapped with the dark tendrils. They were instantly tugged back into the ferocious speed and force. Only the first half of their screams could be heard. Me and the other man scrambled to our feet to escape this room. I managed to get out first. He did not make it out at all. While I did not see him die, I heard the same half-scream coming from the other last survivor. I slammed the door shut behind me just after running through, through it and hearing the third scream. I quickly grabbed a nearby chair and wedged it on the door, hopefully keeping it shut. I could hear the darkness pounding on the door. I swiftly scanned the room. There was a third door and I had, I had not noticed sooner. I rushed to it. I opened the door and immediately heard a hum. Looking in this door, I see that it leads to the basement. Lights are already on. The darkness is not down there. With no other choice, other ways, or certain death, I go down. I shut and lock the door behind me and verify that the light touches all angles of the door. I proceeded down. The basement is windowless. The generator is down here, thus explaining the hum. I glanced at my phone. 20%. 2 p.m. This room truly does not have that much. 
There are outlets here, but I do not have my phone charger. I looked thoroughly in this room. It wasn't hard to notice, but I found a sheet covering something. Something about whatever is under this sheet tugged at my fears and imagination. With the sheet over it, this was shaped like a pedestal. I removed the sheet, but before I could get a good look, I hear the door pounding and a screaming inhuman sound coming from beyond the door. I look back to discover that this is the pedestal, but a black wooden altar of no Catholic design. Of this I am certain. Carved all about this black altar are strange symbols that all appear demonic in design. The curves and lines all feel evil and vile just by looking at them. Everything about this altar looks damning. It is solid, no shells. The top of this altar has curious vials of unknown liquids and strange talismans covering the majority of the surface of this demonic altar. However, one thing stood out on this black abomination, a place a book would go on the very top. There is a space that is rectangular shaped that has no sigils or symbols or talismans on it. I look around the altar and discover the book that should go on top of it. The book is lodged behind. It must have fallen. This book looks old in appearance. It has a bookmark to a page near the end. I couldn't understand any of the words that are written. I flip page after page, only failing to understand anything written whatsoever due to my inability to speak or read the language. All the while, the pounding of the door raged harder and more intense the more I interacted with this book. It is as if the darkness wants this book. What few pictures I discovered here shone dark things and human-shaped, non-human shadows with red eyes just the same as I witnessed earlier this evening. The language of this book is in German. At least, I believe it is German. The realization of this language, of this book, springed my mind to a recent recollection of just moments ago upstairs. What did he call the book he spake of? Durlin's Durhinder? I closed the book to look at the front cover. There it was, the very book he told me about. Dunkelheit.